I want to thank everybody involved with Hacienda for making this happen. Couldn't have done this without you. Um, here throughout the house, I'm sure you're, you're seeing this through the stream, plus those on Facebook. Um, and we're going we're gonna to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, and then I'll give a little speech, and we have uh, some things to cover as far as, like, uh, you know, the video is only pointed at the stage, so th those of the audience can keep their anonymity. We'll have some photography here, which he'll explain the limits on that. I want to make sure that everybody has consent to be on this. And uh, let's, let's get started with introductions. Janet, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Janet. Um... <laughs> I'm here from Eugene, Oregon, where I'm told the weather is beautiful and cool and crisp and fall-like. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm very happy to be here in New York with my voice breaking. Um, I'm the co-author of The Ethical Slut, is probably how most of the new people know me. And also, I've written or co-written a total of 12 books, all of them about various aspects of alternative sexuality or relationships. And I have none of them here with me because the box is coming day after tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But I did bring order forms, and if you want to buy a book today, you can leave a message on the order form about how you want it signed, and I will sell it to you for the same amount as I would have sold it to you and ship it to you. So that's the best I can do. Very gracious of you. Yeah. And Kitty, could you introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm Kitty Shambliss, and I am honored to be here and so excited to be part of this, and thank you for putting it together and for having us here. So Ryan and I have been friends for a while, partly because of our polyamoriness. <laughs> and I, I think that's have... polyamority. <laughs> 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 and I have a blog that I've been writing for about three and a half years now, and that also launched into a podcast, both called Loving Without Boundaries, and I've had a wonderful journey with that. I started out as a monogamous person and then slowly realized, wait a minute, I'm actually polyamorous. And so a lot of my blog is uh, about that journey that I've been on. And my podcast, I interview lots of different people, such as Rai has been on many times, and just have them share their wisdom on their polyamorous journey. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Kitty. <laughs> and Effie? Hello everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Effie Blue. Um, I live here in New York. Um, I'm a relationship coach. I um, specialize in people who are either interested in or transitioning into some sort of ethical non-monogamy. Um, I coach around this idea of relationship by design. Um, if you grab me afterwards, I will bore you to death about it. Um, and um, I'm re really excited and uh, a little nervous to be on this panel and such a heavyweight panel. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Effie. And, and we've discovered we're kind of like left coast, west coast, like I know. duplicates of each yes. other, the mirror. Yes. Um, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I've been hosting these kind of events for about four or five years now. And um, the essence of it is that we're trying to convey a diversity of opinions. And this is just the start of it. We have uh, a lot more special guests coming today. We're going to have three portions of the event with some intermissions in the middle. Uh, so when, when those amazing special guests come up, they'll introduce themselves as well. So stay tuned to the whole thing. Don't miss anything. So basically what we're doing here is uh, a discussion with the audience on non-monogamy as a whole. I, I don't want to limit or or guide us in any one direction besides that you know that could include polyamory it could include swinging monogamish as dan savage would say you know threesomes casual sex i personally put casual dating and the majority of what monogamous people do into the non-monogamy category you know unless you're uh, marrying one person arranged for life and staying with that person you're probably some kind of non-monogamous over the course of your lifetime um, and, and that's kind of my philosophy on a lot of this is that we have a lot more in common than the differences. And besides, what does monogamy mean anyway? It, it, it really doesn't mean what it used to mean. You know, I've, I've um, met many people who consider themselves monogamous and yet they tell me about the threesome they had last night or the adventure that they had on vacation or the convention sex that they had at Dragon Con this year, you know? <laughs> You know, what does it even mean? So, so under those auspices, you know, I just want to feel like everyone is part of this conversation. And we don't have time for everybody's questions, unfortunately. It's a 
packed room down here and a packed room upstairs and a, a lot of people online putting in comments and that, but we'll, we'll get to what we can. So let's, let's get to it. Is there any questions to kick it off? Oh, yes. I can't leave out that detail. Um, would, you, would you like to uh, come around a little bit if you don't mind being on camera here? All right. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm kind of, I don't know, kind of exploring polyamory my, myself, but uh, tonight I'm with the head of the photographer. Uh, the idea with photography here is to do everything again with consent. Uh, Everything here is for the Hacienda Villa, hoping that we might be able to use a few pictures for future events. Um, everything is actually about the more educational, social part of this event. Still, if anybody doesn't want their picture taken, please let me know. And I will definitely, definitely respect that. If I have photographed your picture and before asking you, so please let me know and uh, it will be deleted automatically. Uh, we do want to create some pictures also with the crowd, so if you don't want your picture taken, please don't be in the front. Try to be in the places that are a little bit darker, so you're going to disappear as it is. Uh, but in any case, if you have any hesitation, make sure that I know about it, and then there's not going to be no issues. All right? Uh, the pictures are going to be used, hopefully, for the Hacienda Villa. Uh, maybe for some press publication if they're going to ask, but everything in a more modest way. So. That's about it. If it's not modest way, ask for that. That's a different thing. <laughs> Have fun. Thank you so much. We have an initial question here. Yeah. Sorry, what about photography of the people on the stage? The stage is free range. Yes. 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 Okay. I'm going to present a topic if one of you don't have a question. <laughs> Nobody wants to go first, do they? Well, oh, oh, no. oh first question. Okay, great. Hello. My question is for Rye. I was talking with... Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Carmen. I'm Rye's sister. <laughs> <laughs> and a ham. <laughs> Good work, first up. <laughs> Um, I was talking with my new friend Jarrett here earlier and we were talking a little bit about our background with our parents and what was kind of the trigger for you to become um, or to explore polyamory and um, obviously become an expert in the field. Do you want to start with that? Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, Let's start with the fact that I was at UC Santa Cruz in the early 1970s. Um, and monogamy was not a big issue in UC Santa Cruz in the early 1970s. <laughs> um, it, it, it was kind of the peak of that whole free love thing in, I mean, Santa Cruz is still pretty well mired in the early 1970s as far as I can tell. Um, so I was happily slutting my way around UC Santa Cruz, as we all were. And uh, then I met a guy that I wanted to have as a more important thing in my life. We moved in together. And we just kind of defaulted to monogamy. Um, we never talked about it, never said, OK, we're going to be monogamous now. It's just like, OK, we're together now, so we're monogamous. And that all was fine. We had a couple kids. And about a decade later, it was like waking up from a long night's sleep and going, hey, wait. You know, I, I don't remember saying this is what I wanted. Um, and it wasn't, in fact, what I wanted. That was also the time in my life that I was coming out into BDSM, which turned out to be a journey that he was not interested in taking with me. Um, and so we, we parted as friends. And at that point, I was pretty sure that I was never going to be monogamous again. And, you know, I've been physically monogamous since then. In fact, I've been physically celibate um, at, at various points since then. But I've never promised monogamy and never will again. Um, but interestingly, one of the experiences that led me to an interest in poly happened during that first monogamous marriage because my, my ex has a large family that are all um, concentrated in Yolo County, California, outside Sacramento. And they had a beach house in Santa Cruz. And so holiday weekends, we would all go stay at the beach house in Santa Cruz, and it would be packed to the, to the rafters with uncles and sisters and cousins and aunts. And I noticed that my children were calmer and happier and doing better in their lives in that house with multiple adults around than they were at home doing the nuclear family thing. And that was the first thing that got me to thinking, hey, you know, maybe the nuclear family thing doesn't actually work that well. And I don't think the nuclear family thing, thing in fact, 
does work very well. I think it's a failed experiment from the upper middle class in the middle 20th century um, that we're now starting to, I think one of the reasons that events like this are happening is because whether we're doing it consciously or unconsciously, a lot of us are reaching the conclusion that humans are wired for tribe and tribes have more than three or four people in them. We, we need family. We need large extended family. And poly is one of the ways that we're doing that. Yeah, that's what I keep coming back to also is that, that sense of tribe, whether we're talking about 30,000 years ago where it's a tribe of 150 or if we're, we're talking about uh, uh, my namesake tribe in, in Buffalo and Pittston where there's probably 150 cousins. You know, um, my, my grandparents were one of 12 and one of 11, and then most of them lived out their days and got married, and so there's like 42 aunts and uncles, and then they all have descendants, the one, two, three, five kids apiece. That's quite the tribe. That was my ex-husband's family as well, and it was wonderful. I loved it. And now we're doing blended families where people get divorced and remarried, and, and, and then sometimes they gather together at the holidays anyway with all the kids in the room, so I'm... I'm I'm very much on board with that opinion that we're we're recreating a tribe uh, under new names. I actually have a, a recent thesis that I think is the magic number, the magic combination is three adults, two kids. This came out on Wednesday too. I do think there is something around, it's about um, shared resources, it's about having uh, well, always having someone for a deal breaker, so for a, um, an argument, so you can always have like a vote. And um, I think that the arguments will, will happen less because there's always a deal breaker. And I think for children also to have more than two people available to them, I feel like if it gets more than that, the, the communication breaks down between the adults and the kids like start getting their own way. But I feel like um, three adults and two kids is a magic combo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry on like with this thesis and do some research. Yeah. I'll throw in there that I recently interviewed Dr. Elizabeth Sheff who has done 20 years of research on poly families. And through her research, one of the things that she found was that kids mainly just want care and attention. They just want to know that they're taken care of, care of and that their parents got their back and that they don't care how many adults are doing that. And I thought that was really profound just for her to have done that research and just realize that the kids don't really care what you're doing behind the closed doors. They don't care who you're having sex with. They just want to know that you're there, you know. And that you don't do it in front of their friends. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. Don't embarrass me, Mom. Uh, we, we talk about mother figures and father figures all the time. I, I had a lot of role models and father figures that were not related to me by blood. And, and they end up just becoming a, a, a group of people. You know, it takes, takes a village kind of thing. But the original question was, how did we get on this path? And for me, it was largely about realizing that, um, well, first I was going to become a priest. That didn't work out. <laughs> you know, when I was 17, 18, it was a serious consideration. And if I had been raised Protestant instead of Catholic, I probably would be a preacher with 12 kids. Um, but, you know, Catholic priests have to stay celibate. So that, that didn't work for me. And then I thought that I found someone that I wanted to marry. And a couple years later, I realized that's not the case. Well, now what? And pretty quickly, within a year or two, I was like, you know what? Fuck all the rules. I got to start over and figure out what I want. Because what, what religion and what society and what expectations have told me have just not served me very well. So I might as well start over. And there's no rules. And I stuck to being single for a long time. And, and that made sense, but then it got ridiculous. Like, well, we've been involved for two years. How can we still be single? This doesn't make much sense anymore. And, uh, and, 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 and then it became something of respect, where it's like, you know, I need to honor this multi-year relationship that we've been in. And I'm not just talking to one person. I'm talking to three or four at this point. And it's like, this is really disrespectful to insist that we're single or, or keep it unlabeled. Like, that it's not feeling right. So a lot of it led to just being more honest with myself, more honest with my partners, and, 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 and love, frankly. Nice. And, and, <laughs> yeah, love is a good excuse. Um, sure. Um, so in my um, origin story, as we like to call it around here, um, so I, I have a um, not-so-proud um, history of serial infidelity. Um, I've been married and divorced, um, and I cheated in most of 
um, my long-term relationships in the past. Um, and it, it always, I, I recognized the pattern after a while, which was, I was the, the happier and more settled I felt in a relationship and, and the more I was falling in love with my, my partner, the more promiscuous I felt. And I felt I wanted to go out and meet new people and have other experiences. And, um, and it just felt very natural, but naughty, but I did it anyway. And I didn't like the, um, I didn't like the secrecy and I didn't like the lying. I liked the adventure and the exploration, but not the secrecy and the lying. So I would confess, you know, I would do these things and it would just bottle up, bottle up. And I would like eventually come out to my partners and be like, uh, so here's something that you need to know. Um, I did this and this and this with these people. And it would always end up in anger and heartbreak and tears. And it was just horrible. And then I kept doing it again, over and over again. I thought it would get better if I just got married. You know, if I just signed the contract that it would magically stop doing this, um, didn't work. Um, I had to unsign the contract. Um, so um, I did that for a while and eventually I came to this conclusion that um, relationships aren't for me or more like I am not for relationships. Like I didn't want to hurt any more people. I didn't want to, and these people I, I genuinely loved and cared for. Um, and I didn't want to do that again. I didn't want to cause heartache. Um, so I decided I'm, I'm okay. It's not for me. It's not for everyone. It's not for me. Um, and I poured myself into a, a, a previous corporate career um, which was great for my um, uh, career track record and my bank account not so great for my heart um, I did it for a decade um, and then I found my way to New York um, on for work reasons um, and I you know as I was getting settled here I the the other part of me that I needed to explore is my kinky side. So I wanted to sort of take that route. I'd given up on relationships, but you know, sex is fun. Um, and you know, and I, and I like sex and then I'm kinky and I wanted to explore that. So I went into the sort of the kink route, um, started going to parties, meeting people um, and somebody and one unsuspected night in Brooklyn brought me to Hacienda. <laughs> um, and I met a bunch of people who identified as polyamory and they told me what it was. And I was like, where have you been all my life? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you, I'm not weird. There's a whole bunch of people who are weird, just like me. Um, so that's kind of how I discovered the idea that it was something that was available. And not only just a small group of people, there was a whole community of people who um, were happy and settled and grounded and it didn't feel like they were making things up. It wasn't a story that I was being told. I was, I could see the people. They were happy and there were friendships and different layers of relationships and everybody um, felt like they um, were in a, in a network, a support network, a love network. Um, and I wanted to know more about it. And I kind of just dived, dived in. Um, now, four or five years on, um, here I am sitting on a panel talking about it. <laughs> yeah, that's my story. And how'd you get your start, Kitty? It would like start to def define as polyamorous sure. or, or whatever label that you use. I like the origin story. That sounds good. So my origin story, you may find some pieces of yourselves in and some parts you may not. So um, I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia and I went to 12... Uh, get out! <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and I went to 12 years of Catholic school. And my parents sent me there because they thought I would get a good education. It wasn't actually because they were religious. But, you know, when you go to Catholic school, you become experts in shame and guilt and in learning all these dysfunctional things about your sexuality. So I was taught sex is bad. If I even think about masturbating, I'm going to go blind, you know, and all these crazy ideas. And I also, because of going to Catholic school and just that environment I was brought up in, which was very suburbanite, drank the Kool-Aid of monogamy. And that was all I knew about. I just thought that's the way we're supposed to be, you know, um, heteronormative monogamy. And so I just went down that path, which I've heard talked about as the relationship escalator. So I was doing the, I'm looking for my Prince Charming, you know, and we just go from relationship to relationship. And one part that's similar to your story is I embarked on this serial cheating monogamist journey. So I would go out with one man and then I'd think, wow, that guy might be a little better, you know? And so before I would make the leap, I would cheat on, you know, guy number one with guy number two, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And I did that, honestly, for about a decade. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to admit now, since I'm on the stage with you guys. 
Um, and I learned that, you know, A, cheating sucks. You know, I felt shitty. Um, as far as I knew, I didn't get caught. <laughs> but, you know, still I started to um, just realize that my values were changing and I wanted to live my life with more integrity. So uh, eventually I decided I wasn't going to cheat anymore. I had a couple missteps with that. Um, and eventually I met my husband who is here with me today. And he had a similar story where he was also a cheating serial monogamist. And we just had a frank conversation with each other and just said, hey, cheating sucks. I don't want to do that to you and you don't want to do that to me. So what are we going to do about that? And we just decided that we were just going to keep open conversations and let us define how our relationship and eventually our marriage was going to look instead of letting society and everyone else tell us how that's going to look. I later learned that was called self-determination. <laughs> and we eventually uh, got married very untraditionally at a lighthouse and we wrote all of our own vows and we just left out all of the and forsake all others and we just left in you know love and honor and all that stuff so that we were never going to be breaking our vows and at that point we were still mostly exclusive with each other so my journey kind of takes a, a steer to the right where we also discovered a nudist resort we were like hey let's go to this place called Hedo and see what that's all about and we ended up after the first I would say 10 minutes of being nude you know which feels really really awkward in front of you know all these people you don't know after you know that period passed we were like this is freaking awesome and so then we kind of explored a little bit more of the swingers style of ethical non-monogamy, which was a lot of fun, and we ended up making some really good friends out of that. But what we found, too, was that we really enjoyed the um, the deep friendships that we were creating with these people, not just the recreational sex aspect of it. We really enjoyed the, the relationships. And then uh, my story takes another turn to the left, and um, shortly after we were married, I had a series of losses. My father died of cancer. Um, we found out that we were infertile and we couldn't have our own children. Then my mother died. And all of these things kind of sent me down this spiral. And I ended up dealing with depression, which was really weird because I was really happy person my whole life. So at first I was really confused. And then I also realized I was having this major, major midlife crisis because I was like, you know, am I not a mom? Am I gonna adopt children? Am I monogamous? What am I? And uh, so I had to deal with that and I ended up going through therapy, frankly, for about a year and a half. And somewhere around this journey, a friend of mine introduced me uh, to the ethical slut. <laughs> and somewhere along this, I read, I literally read the first, I think, five pages of your book and I like dropped the book and I was just stood up and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. There's actually people doing this. This is crazy, you know? And what I realized is that there wasn't something wrong with me. I always thought there was something wrong with me why I couldn't settle down and be with just one person. There's this thing called polyamory that I'd never heard of. So your book changed my life. It really changed my life. And, <laughs> and it's an honor to be sitting next to you. Um, and so I read the book as quickly as I could and I had to keep putting it down because it was just so overwhelming And I, then I gave it to my husband. I was like you have to read this book. Oh my god Apparently I've been polyamorous forever and I had no idea um, And so that helped me frankly uh, get out of my midlife crisis as I started to define who I was So I defined that I am a married polyamorous woman and eventually we decided to be child free by choice and I just slowly started to get out of that weird place I found myself in and and then we eventually started having relationships with other people. And, and that's around the time that I met Rise, because uh, I do feel jealousy sometimes. <laughs> and yeah, and, and also it was, you know, it didn't start out smoothly. I mean, I was learning as I went. I mean, I had some books, but not a lot of books to look to. And there weren't a lot of leaders in the field to turn to. So that's around the time that I started the blog. I partly started um, the blog so that I could... Um, build a community of other like-minded people and then find other people that were going through some of the th same things that I was going through. And that helped bring me here today. There's, there's a lot of common themes up here. You know, uh, one of the big ones being, you know, pressure from the outside world, wherever it be, our family, society, whatever it might be, to conform to some sense of normality, uh, uh, some sense of heteronormativity, and then realizing, no, no, not for me. And, and, and I'm so fascinated the way that uh, 
culture and community and in particular writing ends up uniting us. Tell me a little bit about what it was like when you first published The Ethical Slut. Like, it was 97, correct? 97. Yeah. Um, We're getting close to the 20th anniversary. Yes, in fact, there's going to be a, a, a revised new edition next year for the 20th anniversary. Random House has off, asked us to create one. So we're working on that right now. Um, 20 fucking years. I mean, <laughs> um, the, the biggest change is just uh, in public awareness. At the time uh, that we wrote the first edition of the book, uh, there was very little public awareness of polyamory as an option. We, we had to explain the word. And in fact, if you have the first edition, I, I know I signed at least one this evening, you'll note that we, we didn't use the word polyamory in it. There's one paragraph about polyamory in which we say, nobody has the same definition, no two people have the same definition of polyamory, so we're just gonna leave that there. When we did the second edition, 10 Speed wanted us to use the word polyamory, so we did. Um, but you'll still talk to quite a few people who will tell you that Ethical Slut is not a polyamory book because we don't talk much about long-term committed relationships among multiple people. We treat those as only one of the many options that are out there. But um, there were a couple of things that inspired us. One was me being in bed for a month with bronchitis off my ass on codeine and watching through my fever and codeine haze, indecent proposal on television. Um, the one where Robert Redford pays, wants to pay a million dollars for Demi Moore to cheat on Woody Harrelson with him, spend one night with him. And I'm lying in bed thinking, wait, a million dollars, Robert Redford, one, wait. <laughs> And, and I kind of got it very viscerally at that moment that I was operating from a very different value set than, than <laughs> most of the world. And then the, the next thing that happened was uh, Dossie and I were doing a, um, a BDSM workshop at, of all places, a Mensa gathering in Big Sur. <laughs> And so we, we did our little BDSM intro uh, workshop in the afternoon, and Dossie went home because she couldn't stand how heterosexual it was at Mensa, but I stuck around. Um, <laughs> and there was a hot tub thing that night, and I ran into a friend of mine outside the tubs, and she said, you should have heard the conversation in my hot tub. And I said, okay, I'll bite. What was the conversation in your hot tub? And she said, it was, did you hear about that S&M workshop this afternoon? There were these two women doing it, doing it, and they were talking about stuff they had done together, and one of their boyfriends was right in the room. <laughs> so that was when we figured we needed to write a book, because we had sort of thought that what we did that was outrageous was our BDSM stuff, but we found out very quickly that the BDSM stuff was easy for a lot of people because either you're into it, in which case you already are open to it, or you're not, in which case you can go, oh yeah, that's what those weird ladies at the, at the Mensa thing were talking about. But Polly, everybody is up against these questions, whether they've made it, made it explicit or not. Everybody either has been tempted or has made promises that they find difficult to keep or would like to not to make promises because they don't want to keep them. It's not a thing you can just shunt over as being what those weirdos do. And so people took it a lot more personally when, when we did uh, Slut. Um, we did a lot of morning drive radio, which I can tell the story of why we did all the morning drive radio if you want. But the point is that we were on the West Coast getting up at 4.30 in the morning to talk to Howard Stern wannabes in Rochester, New York. Um, and people were phoning in, and they were angry. I mean, it wasn't just like, this isn't for me. It wasn't just, what are your weirdos doing? It's One woman told us we were the cause of the decline of Western civilization. I've gotten that one. Which we, we were impressed. We were very pleased to know that we... <laughs> We personally were responsible for the decline of Western civilization. <laughs> Another one uh, told us that we needed to be tied up and whipped. And, and I will say that... <laughs> at that point, the, the DJ actually went... <laughs> 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 but it was really striking to us how, how angry people were. And it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around it, but what I finally got is imagining if I were the age I am now, 50, 60, um, and I had spent my entire life monogamous and unhappy, but monogamous because I had been told all along that it was the only thing I could do, 
And now here I am, 50, and I've been miserable in my marriage for however long, and some broad comes on the radio and says, no, you don't have to. You never had to. You can do it all, all kinds of other ways, and it can be fine. I would be fucking furious. <laughs> I would be outraged. And probably I would probably not be self-aware enough to be outraged at the people who had lied to me in the first place. I would be outraged at the broad on the radio. And so I think that's why we were getting that kind of anger. But that's easier now than it was. There's more people, even if they're not choosing Polly, even if they still think it's kind of weird. It was on the cover of fucking Newsweek a couple of years ago. It's hard not to be aware. I have a question. Yes. Um, when we talk about polyamory and BDSM and all of that, and it's all thrown into one category now. Um, it's funny specifically. Hold on, can I get you on the mic so that everybody yeah. can hear? Okay. Um, right. Funny Thank Amory. You. Like BDSM, we focus a lot on consent. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are in a relationship that's consensual, non-consent, yes. how on earth do you handle polyamory? Um, pretty much the same way everybody else does, uh, is my short answer to that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask that you bring that question up again when Melina is on the stage, because that's really her wheelhouse more than it is mine. I, know, I was like, oh, beep, 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 beep. Yeah. <laughs> But I will say, um, just to, to get my own little oar in the water on this, that no relationship in which core needs are not being met is going to work, ever. Um, when you get into consensual non-consent, you're playing with stuff that is things you want or things you don't want. But if the needs are not being met, it ain't going to fly. Would you agree with that, Mom? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, again, let's, let's postpone that one until we have the real expert on the stage, but okay. Uh, okay. You know, another thing that, you know, you're talking about the broad on the radio and all that, yeah. um, you're putting together that juxtaposition, ethical and slut. You're, you're putting the pejorative next to something very praiseworthy and respectable. That was actually a joke while we were working on the manuscript. We, call, we kept calling it the ethical slut, which Dossie can come up with. And it was a joke between the two of us. And we kept saying, yeah, OK, very funny. But we're going to have to come up with a real title for this book sooner or later. <laughs> and then the book was finished. And we had to have a cover done for it. And we hadn't thought of anything. Everything else we came up with just sounded so plonky and... and pedantic and not fun and we wanted it to be and we told everybody and they said no you totally have to call it the ethical slut and we were scared to death um we did not think that we were going to get away with that shit but we did <laughs> <laughs> i absolutely love it yeah what what do you think about that word itself slut like what is what does that mean to you in this context well i think partly your book helped me own the word slut because i felt a lot of shame and guilt around sex and also when i read in your book what I'd been saying out loud, but seeing it in black and white, sex is fun and pleasure is good for you. I was like, hallelujah. It's so <laughs> nice to see this in print. So um, so I really enjoyed uh, the book title and the whole concept in terms of owning the word slut and realizing that, you know, sex is awesome. Let's enjoy it and let's stop shaming and slut shaming and all that stuff. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, it, it, interesting. I have always been um, really comfortable with my sexuality. Actually, I've never. Um, I, I I hear the shame and the guilt, and you know, um, personally, my internal world, like introspectively, I've, that's the one part of me that I've been comfortable with all my life. And I remember my earliest sort of sexual memories are like age four. Like I've managed to like dig down. Um, so I've been, you know, and I joke about you know how I'm like besties with my vagina. That's one of my like fun things to say. Um, so I've I really felt like my sexuality was a part of my um, sexual expression. Um, but I also realized that that wasn't okay to tell people. I never felt the shame personally. I just knew that I was it was going to make other people uncomfortable. So I kept it secret for other people. Um, and with the ethical slut and the word of the slut, and now like you know my my community, my friends all own it. Now I can you know come forward and and so my insides match my outsides, and my insides match my words. Um, so it was really cool to just like see slut as like a badge of honor um, that I can I can really identify how I feel out loud to people. I mean, that's the essence of the problem of what we're doing right now is we're talking about it, right? Like, that's what all of us are doing, whether it be in writing or on a stage, on video, whatever the case may be. Just talking about being honest with sex, you know, it's, 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 it's the big difference between whether you're in or out on these things. Is it hidden, secret, behind closed doors, or is it on a fucking stage, 
right? Sure. It's also required for um, for the advancement of the species. Right? You need to eat and you need to fuck. Like, you, the, the really, that's all you need to do in order for us to just carry on on this planet. We need to eat, we need to feed ourselves, and we need to fuck. And it, it, it's hunger and sex drive. Same. It's it's a need. It's a drive, right? You know, people do crazy things for food. People do crazy things for 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 sex, and both are required on a personal level for happiness and and feeling whole and and all that kind of stuff. But also for for the species in general. So uh, I have I have two children, and I assure you, I have had sex more than twice. So <laughs> I, 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 I think that there are there. I think when we turn it into being reproduction only, um, A, it's a little heterocentric because a lot of people are going to have a whole lot of sex that is never, ever, ever going to make any babies unless someone invents some new parts. Um, and it, it, it seems to me to, to diminish sex a little to talk about it as reproduction because it's, it's a, I, I don't have a metaphor ready to hand. I'm sorry, I'm usually good at that sort of thing. Um, but... Reproduction is swell. I'm, I'm all for it. I love my children like I love myself more, actually. Um, but one was an accident, one was on purpose, and it is a joke between my mother and my sister and me that it has never taken any one of us more than two tries at unprotected intercourse to get knocked up. We are the fertile, fertile, hardy women. Um, so I have sex, well, Back when I was having sex, I, I don't anymore, which is another story, but back when I was having sex, I had it um, for ecstatic reasons, I had it for relationship bonding reasons, I had it for adventuring reasons, I had it for oh so very many reasons, and out of all those times, there was one that I was actually trying to get knocked up. So. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to argue with the, the, the fundamental need to, to reproduce, because we, we do want humans to still be on the planet. Sure. I, I, the earth must be people, to quote Shakespeare. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, respectfully, I, I totally hear that. And we also don't need to have um, handmade chili truffles to, for nutrition. Yet we do. We go out there and we explore food. We explore these delicate, you know, decadent way of eating. Um, and that's not to be fill our bellies, um, but for pleasure also. And I feel like that about sex. It's Sure, we need it for survival, but we also explore and, and indulge both in food and sex, even though it's not necessarily needed. One of the things I'm trying to do in, even more in the, in the new edition of Slut that we're working on is to pay better attention to sex as a, a very broad category um, as opposed to genital sex. So, so we got some critical feedback during the last couple of go-rounds uh, from the asexual community, which is becoming more visible and more um, populous, basically. Uh, and I, I really don't want to exclude that because I think asexuals have some really important things to say. I've been to a couple of asexual workshops just to hear what they're saying, and the the number of their talking points that are exactly the same as my talking points is really interesting. About all the ways there are to have a relationship, all there all the ways there are to bond with somebody, um, and putting tab A in slot B is not necessary to that. Um, and I think I'm sort of losing my point here, uh, but. Sex in a broad category, I mean, if you've done Tantra and you've put your hand on someone's chest and looked into their eyes and breathed with them and you've both had orgasms, that you get it right away that you don't have any idea where sex begins and ends. It's, it's just out there. It's everywhere. And I, I think that's one of the core values I want to bring to, to my teaching about poly is recognizing all of those things, even if they don't look like what um, your eighth grade science teacher told you sex was, um, they are. They, they are all ways that we let erotic energy flow through. I, I wanted to comment, you, during your introduction, you were talking about even monogamous people um, often are turn out to be poly. I would say always, because um, <laughs> monogamous, whether, <laughs> when, 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 I'm, when I'm talking, I don't mean they're necessarily having sex with other people, genital sex with other people. They're not. Um, my first husband is God's own monogamist. He, he really does live that way and prefer to live that way. But when I'm talking with straight audiences, one of the things I like to fuck with their heads on is to ask for 
not that I ever intentionally fuck with anybody's head. Um, Never, come on. Is to ask for a show of hands about how many people in the audience have at some point in their life had a best friend with whom they are deeply intimate, uh, in some ways perhaps more intimate than they are with their primary partner. And most of the hands go up. And I said, then you've done it. You've been poly. If you're managing two relationships with people who have different needs, if you have kids, you're poly. You're trying to take care of multiple people you love whose needs are sometimes in opposition with one another and you have to find a way to balance them that's fair to everybody, you're doing it. You know, we, we coin a lot of jargon and one of the main words that's supposedly unique to Polly is compersion. You know, this idea of instead of feeling pain when our partners are happy and enjoying their lives with other people, we're feeling pleasure about it. And one of the examples that I give to monogamous people to go, oh, I, I could never know if I saw my partner having sex with someone else or heard about it or even thought about it, I'd be hurting. I was like, well, let's take sex out of the equation. Let's talk about the emotions because that's what compersion is. It's an emotion. And imagine a teacher, child, and a parent and the parent witnesses the teacher and child interacting. And they have this, this feeling of like, oh, that's so cute, that's so great, look at that. And they go, but, but that's mine, that's my child. And so they might actually be feeling both jealousy and compersion at the same time. Mixtures of joy and pain and all this thing. Or even like a cat, someone comes over to your place and pets your cat, and for once the cat doesn't bite them, but then you go to pet your own cat and it bites you. <laughs> You know, and, and you're like, whoa, that's so cute. You're getting along with my cat, but that's my but cat. Hey. <laughs> so, so I'm not trying to say that you must feel only one emotion at a time. What I'm saying is, is that we are very complex creatures that feel a lot of things. And you know, it's not like just a dial like I am 100% happy today and 0% everything else. Or I'm 100% jealous right now with zero compersion. I think it's more like each thing is its own category rather than some kind of balancing weight scale. And, and when you get into what all this means regarding sluthood, it's, it's pleasure at its essence, whether it be uh, a massage, like people, you know, food, massage. Uh, Intellectual conversation. Yeah, that, right, yeah. right. You could be a conversation slut. Yeah. Like people are using that word way outside of the context of sexual energy. It's just enjoying life on some deep level and, and, mm, embracing it to the point that other people might find extreme. I saw a question here, yeah. Um, and then over here. Yeah, we're going to try to use the mic so everybody can hear the questions. Great. I, I want to be very respectful of the, uh, the question about CNC and Molina's expertise around that. And also, I still really am interested in your concepts of consent and how they have evolved because both Kitty and Effie have talked about being in cheating relationships um, and the evolution of consent as you've become aware of your uh, poly. Um, I've read some of Janet's um, analysis of the some of the weaknesses in the the T metaphor um, so I'm very interested in, in that and I, I don't know anything about how your concept of consent has evolved. So I'm, I'd, I'd like to open that up a little bit if, that, if that's okay. Um, I will start by saying I think a lot of the conversation these days around consent, it's terribly important conversation to have. It tends to drift strongly into the binary um, as though consent were either on or off a toggle switch. And particularly when you get into any kind of BDSM power play, we all know it's it's not. It, there are many levels of consent and you don't hear it so much anymore because people are so inflamed around the idea of consent. But when I came of age in BDSM, we talked often about seducing consent as being what the top or the dom does during BDSM, where you feed them a little bit of something they like and then you buy enough reason to stay in the scene that you can try something that's difficult for them and then you give them a little bit more of what they like and then you take uh, and that seducing consent is a good phrase for that but it you do have to acknowledge the fact that consent comes in gradations um, and it's never going to be entirely possible to build a schema around consent that is on and off um, 
so many things, how turned on we are, how endorphinized we are, how intoxicated we are, uh, what mood we're in, what time of month it is, yada, yada, all of these things affect consent. Um, all of these things gray its edges out. And I think all we do when we treat consent as though it were tea, to use one example, um, is it's like the Reefer Madness films they used to show me when I was in grade school. Yes, I am that old. They used to show me these, these movies um, of, of making drugs so awful on the screen that when I went out into the real world and saw that drugs were not in fact all that terrible, then I didn't know what to believe anymore. I have at least one friend who is hep C positive because she knew that pot wasn't as bad as she had learned in school. She knew that acid wasn't as bad as she had learned in school. So she thought, well, heroin couldn't be all that bad either. Um, so w when we treat consent as though it were black and white, I think we run the risk of not having people hear our messages around consent at all. And that's the risk that I see in, in that kind of thinking. But it does mean that we have to think um, harder and humans are really lazy about wanting to think hard, in my experience. It's so much easier if you can just come up with a nice little binary on and off metaphor and, and leave it there. Um, that's really interesting, actually. Um, I agree that the tea metaphor falls short, though it it appeals to enough people and makes it front of mind, so I think it's actually kind of good to have it out there, but I do think that it falls short. Um, so when I talk about consent, um, consent is about boundaries, right? This is where the, the, you know, the, your boundaries and expressing your boundaries, and I think it's it's worth addressing the boundary side of things. And when I talk about boundaries, I um, so we use a little metaf metaphor. It is essentially a boundary is a line in the sand, right? Here is it's not okay to go over this line, um, and I, I talk about um, what that line, what that boundary is made of as, as a metaphor. For example, some boundaries are brick walls, right? It's the things that you're not interested. You're not even interested in seeing what's on the on the other side. You're just it's a brick wall. You don't even want to go there. Some boundaries are um, wired fences, right? You know what's on the other side. You're firmly staying on your side, and you see what's on the other side, and you may get close to it, but you're not really interested in and crossing over and and some boundaries are um, made out of elastic right and they will stretch based on what's around it right if, if it gives it'll stretch and you'll just edge a little bit more a little bit more so I do agree that it's not a matter of on off I want this I don't want this but what is your boundary what is it made of um, what are the things around it that that makes you is it flexible is it just a matter of entertaining the other side or is it like I'm not interested um, and then being able to communicate those um, for consent um, and I think that that's really important to recognize those things, but I do think that that requires a lot of thinking, a lot of self-awareness, being able to communicate at a high level, and those are big asks. So I think there is definitely a room for making it binary and easy to people to just to at least be aware of it, but as a foundation, and then to think about it and to really analyze it and and, re and, and discover it for yourself and being able to communicate it, I think is important. And context is really important. Um, uh, con you know, consent in, in, in terms of sex is one thing, sex with one partner versus a sex party versus, uh, versus an orgy is a different type of consent. Um, consent in relationships is different, like the, the style of the relationship. So you mentioned cheating, for example. Like what is cheating that needs to be defined? Um, in in you know in the context of consent, so um, it's it's a it's a complex it's a complex topic. I think. I would say for me, the topic of consent comes down to agreements, which overlaps boundaries. But in terms of for me, not cheating and having consent is all about you know what are your agreements and making everything as transparent as possible, and really trying to honor what your boundaries are and determining what your boundaries are and figuring out what those agreements are with your partner and just trying to make sure that that all works for everybody so that you're not so cheating in any relationship whether it's monogamous or polyamorous is all about breaking those agreements and one topic that Ryan and I have talked about before is in terms of how I work with my relationships the concept and I love these these terminology of open awareness and open approval so if you're not familiar with those open awareness is when you 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 have the permission from your partner and with yourself to do whatever you like as long as the next time that you are with that partner, you let them know, hey, guess what? 
Friday night I had sex with a new person and I want to tell you before we have sexual intimacy with each other. So it's an awareness in the sense that you're letting them know right away. Whereas open approval is you actually have to get your partner or partner's approval before you engage with anybody else. Um, so to me that was very helpful terminology to help me define where those agreements and those boundaries are. And it can be different with each partner. You know, so it's just something, and that's where the communication, I think, comes in, is you just have to be very good at learning how to communicate with your partners and trying to do it in a non-blaming and critical way so that you can have these open conversations in a safe environment with your partners. I, so, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you, you just used a really important word, I think, which is the word blaming. Um, and I think a lot of the dialogue I'm seeing around consent these days, if you tease it apart, it's looking for someone to blame when something goes wrong. And I think that there definitely are times when that is appropriate. Um, ignoring a safe word would be a really good example of a time to look for someone who, who did something wrong. 90% of the things that feel non-consensual or borderline consensual are communications issues um, or you don't find out that you need an agreement until you've stepped on something and all of a sudden you find out that you yeah. need an agreement. Um, or things of that nature. And I think looking for someone to blame is exactly the wrong approach. Um, Charlie Glickman has written a good piece about accidental consent violations versus, what was the other word he used? Can you? Anyway, um, intentional. Uh, yeah, a accidental consent violations versus intentional. And I think when we feel like we've been violated, it's really easy to go in, into projecting that someone has done an intentional consent violation because we feel like we've been fucked with, we feel bad, we want to point a finger and say it's your fault. If we take a moment and breathe and spend some time with it, it may turn out that it isn't. I think accidental consent violations happen a great deal more often than intentional ones. I don't think there are that many villains in the world. There are some. There are definitely some, but not lots. I make an, a lot of analogies on what you just said regarding uh, the way cars work on the road. There's a lot of accidents that happen. And sometimes when someone rear ends you, it's their fault. And yet it was an accident. They didn't intend to destroy the back end of your car. Other times, people are drunk out of their mind, crashing into things. Well, you've now multiplied what you can blame them for in the sense of, you know, you, you knew this when you got in the car. You shouldn't have done that. It, it goes beyond just an oops at some point. And, and then you've got the difference between, you know, if you are a drunk driver versus a drunk pedestrian and the drunk driver runs over a drunk pedestrian. They're both drunk, but one has a weapon of death that they're driving. Right. So, so when you get into all the analogies of these things, I, I strongly agree that we need to have some variation. Like you can look at other um, crimes, like let's say murder, right? Homicide. You've got manslaughter. You've got negligent. You've got intentional, planned motive. So you've got the difference there between a villain and someone who is careless. Yeah, I think in all disagreements, um, both consent disagreements and relationship disagreements, um, it is remarkably useless to look backwards and see who to blame. Um, it's far more helpful to find out how we're going to stop this from ha happening again. Because if you figured out how to, how to change the past, you don't need to be sitting here listening to me. You should be out making millions and millions of dollars. Um, you can't. You can't change the past. You can maybe change how you think about what happened in the past, but mostly you want to stop it from happening again. So we have, uh, I believe, a few questions and maybe comments from the audience. So let's try to get to some of them. Um, we had one over here. I was curious uh, what you think the main obstacles are that keep poly from getting greater mainstream acceptance and, and practice. And I was, I guess, what I've wondered when I think about this a lot is, to, to, I mean, I, men and women are obviously different in different ways. And, um, you know, for a lot of women, you know, there's the issue in the mainstream society of having children and the 18 year of investment that that's going to require, you know, from, from a man. And I think that that is the main fear that keeps women from feeling safe or secure and having more like open relationships. I don't, I'm just curious what your thoughts about and do you see a path towards that? G gaining greater mainstream acceptance and, and, and what are the social obstacles that, that are preventing it? Does that make sense? 
Yes. Before we get into that, though, I just wanted to see, did you guys have comments or questions related to the consent stuff we were just discussing? Let, let's get to that and then move on to the next topic. Oh, the mic, please. Thank you. So I hear the words cheating and agreements, and, and there's a concept that I think is useful um, to, to pop into this conversation, which is the concept of secrecy versus privacy in relationship. And I haven't heard that talked about yet in terms of um, relationship. And there's, to me, there's a big difference between having privacy in a coupleship. In a coupleship. I've been married for 35 years. Yeah, I get a merit badge. So does he. Trust me. Um, and we're, you know, I don't love the labels. Um, but what I do care about is privacy versus secrecy. And I would love to hear you guys take that on a little bit because it's sort of a different way of framing this conversation. I, I think the frame matters a lot. I think cheating, um, you know, it's a historical word that I'm not sure always applies today because, for one, it assumes you're playing a game and that there's some way to win it, and there's some loser. There's a winner and a loser in this game of life, and cheating is the best way to win. I don't know. It's a strange, it's a strange way that we're using that. So, so I'm personally a very private person. Like, the way I like to frame my privacy, you know, even though I'm here on a stage talking about my sex life, um, the passwords to all my accounts, nobody has passwords to anything. Nobody can look at my phone without permission. There's, nobody has access to the way I communicate with the world except for when I intend to do it. So that's, that's the way I have my privacy, which, which some people might see these words as synonymous, you know? Um, actually, the, the word that I um, heard Katie use is transparency, which is I use in my in my coaching. Um, I don't actually subscribe to radical honesty, like just just plunking it out there. I think it's a I think it's an aggressive and a selfish way of being. Like I'm just going to tell you the truth, and you deal with that. So um, I actually don't think that I think that um, everybody lies, and I think the occasional white lie um, to sort of keep everybody happy isn't a bad thing. Um, but transparency is important, and I think transparency um, kind of gives me like the 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 distinction between um uh, privacy and secrecy transparency allowing the other person to able to see through and make conscious decisions so you're not inhibiting the other person's decision making right you don't have to give them everything you don't have to tell them everything about you but i think that if you're in a relationship with somebody and you're kind of aligning your lives together you need to be able to provide them a clear path so they can make conscious decisions about their path and about the relationship and i think that's where the secrecy and privacy split at least that's how i think about it i'd love to hear from I'll talk about this. I, I've actually thought a lot about privacy and secrecy, partly because I write a blog. So this has kind of come up because a lot of times I am talking about my intimate relationships online for any of you to read it. So uh, I've I've had I've even been called out like, hey, I didn't expect you to talk about that. So I had to really think about where that line is between privacy and secrecy. And uh, one thing I can say is in terms of my relationships with my two partners, what I really honor and like about how they handle it is they are very respectful for the privacy of their partners. So we kind of handle it in terms, I have to come back to agreements, which is as long as you're not violating one of our agreements, then you only have to tell me the things that I have to know. And if you've had a private conversation with your partner and they've had a private conversation with their partner, that's none of my business. So I think it's really defining where the boundaries are between what is my business and what is not my business. And what's the part of the agreements that I have with them is if it's if it's going to affect me directly, well, then I need to know about that. But if it's your your personal life, or also we were talking about being an introvert or an extrovert, I think that comes into play too. I'm a little bit more of an extrovert, but my partners are more introverted. And so what I've had to learn was to respect their space when like, I'm, I want to talk, especially because I'm a blogger and a writer. I'm like, I want to talk about this. You know, let's let's talk about it right now. And they're like, whoa, you know, I need some time to process this. I need some private time. You know, so to me, that's another way I define between, you know, privacy and, and all of that so that they can have what they need to make their decisions and then come to me when they're ready. And I think sometimes privacy is partly like, 
I don't ever want to talk about that. That's that's my personal stuff. I don't need to, you know, if I don't need to tell you that and it's not breaking one of our agreements, then we're just not going to talk about it. And I had to learn to respect that. So I hope that helps. I've seen everything work in relationships all the way from full on don't ask, don't tell, which I know is very unfashionable these days, but I've seen it work often enough that I, I'm not going to, I never tell people that something that's working for them is not right. Because i Quite a few people out there, they have don't ask, don't tell with their spouse with the proviso, just never let it come to my attention, ever. And they've had that for 30 years, and it's working fine. Thank you very much. So I don't argue. All the way through, you know, and then he did the thing with his tongue where he was writing the letters of the alphabet on my clit. Um, it's... What, what, what matters is that you are ready, you have some agreement about what, what it's okay to share, what should be kept private, and what should not be told to anybody. Um, and that has to go for each person in in the in the in the relationship. Uh, it it doesn't necessarily have to be parody. Uh, uh, usually, I, I did watch one couple break up because part of A's desires about being poly were to come home and talk about their wonderful adventures to B, and B really, really, really didn't want to hear about the wonderful adventures, and they could not find a compromise on that, and so they they ended on that. Um, but for the most part, it's just finding a level of disclosure that works for each person involved. And um, there's no wrong or right way to do it. You just, it's, it's what's right for you. So many thoughts, so many responses to so many things. Uh, you mentioned transparency. And um, what I've seen, you know, a lot of these terms, these labels, these, these words, they're regional and cultural. And between different cultures in different regions, will, there'll be great disagreement. And the people that I've known in Los Angeles who have really subscribed to transparency mean the exact opposite of what you're saying. And they mean 100% see it all, absolutely everything, access to everything, anytime, anywhere, 100% transparent. So it's interesting to hear you use that in a, in a, in a sense of like... The, Correct me if I'm wrong. You said uh, enough information to to may have a clear path to make decisions. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that so that everybody in the relationship can make decisions for themselves and th for the and for the relationship itself. But I agree. And then the thing here's the thing with labels in just general. I think labels help you land on the same page with somebody, and then you need to use your words to get on the same paragraph. Right. So we need labels so you can like have a starting point of a conversation. So if I say transparency, then we know we're talking about the subject in the context of this. And then we need to sort of find our words and hopefully go back and forth until we kind of understand what it means for, for you, what it means for me and, and everybody in the room. I think that's kind of the, the it's, it's worth having the labels so we can get on the same page. And then we kind of have to do the extra work to understand exactly what we're talking about. One of the best questions in the world is, what exactly do you mean by that? Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me more. I think we had another, another question or comment. Oh, upstairs? Yes. Will we be able to hear? Yes. Excellent. Go ahead, upstairs. All I hear is a toilet flushing. Uh, hello? Perfect sound effects. I th hello? I think we're on one of those morning radio shows now. Yeah, we have a question right here. Great. Oh. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, so my question is, um, one of the least appealing things about monogamy for me is how much it plays into capitalist notions of scarcity, ownership, commodification, and, and so on. So in what ways do you think the ideology of abundance in non-monogamy can help provide alternative love economies or... Alternatively, do you, think, do you feel that certain kinds of non-monogamy actually serves to problematically perpetuate a consumerist and commodified vision of love, sex, and affection. I think that there is a lot in common with this question and the previous question, which we said we were going to come back to, which is what is preventing the mainstream popularity of these concepts? And I think scarcity is intimately tied into what is preventing it, a scarcity mentality versus an abundant mentality. I, I do think that when you talk in the general public about Polly, that's the picture they have, is the, the guy with the harem. 
um, and that and it has a, a sort of Hefner esque uh, uh, consumerist capitalist flavor to it, and people are put off by the idea, and rightly so, um, of having multiple lovers as status symbols. Um, there, there is. There is concern to be had there. Uh, I don't think it's inherent in either monogamy or poly um, that they should tie into an ownership paradigm. Uh, I think that monogamy can be an informed choice that does not involve feelings of ownership. It, it is a choice, and you choose to focus your attention inwardly rather than outwardly. That's an intelligent choice. Um, and I think Paul, I, 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 I'm reluctant to draw direct parallels between any form of relationship inherently uh, with a political stance. I do think that abundance is a good place to start from. But I think abundance is a really easy place to start from when you're starting from a place of privilege. Um, and that it, anybody here who feels able to say, yes, my life is abundant, feel very fortunate that you can do that, because not everybody can. Um, and I've lost my train of thought, so somebody else should say something now. I would say in terms of abundance, um, for me, that's one of the reasons that I love polyamory. I mean, that feeling of, you know, that, that love isn't a one-sum game. I always love the metaphor of a checking account. You know, it's not, with love, we're not taking money out of the checking account. It's, it's given freely. It's not something that we're losing. By loving one person, you're not taking love away from this person. You can love them all, and your love can grow. And I really love that concept of abundance and how it relates to polyamory. And in terms to your question, if I uh, think about my friend circles, uh, some of my friends, when they get confused about polyamory or when I'm talking about it, um, one of the resistance that I usually see is that they seem threatened. They, there's a, uh, they think if I look at their husband and say he looks handsome that I'm going to go after him. <laughs> you know? like there's this, and I try and explain, them, I'm like, that's not how this works. <laughs> you know. Um, but I think that the concept of being threatened is uh, one of the things that makes people have a hard time wrapping their head around polyamory. And also I think... Um, jealousy and possessiveness we've just been so trained that way um as we grow up you know because i never realized there was other choices other than monogamy and i think that's the same for lots of people so now that polyamory is getting a little bit more airplay it's still such a brand new idea and one thing i've had to realize is instead of getting all you know you have to accept me accept my polyness you know i have to remember that i am in a monogamous world you know most people are monogamous and that's what they know so we are fighting an uphill battle but just the fact that we're all sitting here talking about it you know i think is helping that every single day um actually i um sometimes make the joke that being poly is like being left-handed it's like being left-handed in a right-handed world and if you just pay attention i don't know is anybody left-handed here Right, you guys know what it's like to live in a right-handed world, and, and and it's like the rest of us were just like, what do you mean? Like you swipe and go, you know? And you guys have to adjust, right? You have to be like, you know, everything opens a certain way, and it's a very right-handed world, and you guys have to, you know, make your way in a very right-handed world being left-handed. I feel like Polly is the same. You kind of everything is set one way, and you're sort of like navigating your way around. Um, um, so that's kind of interesting you say that. And the other thing I want to talk about in the abundance is um. So abundance, we talk about abundance of love, right? And love is a feeling and it lives in our internal internal universe, which is infinite, right? Your internal your feelings, there isn't any kind of um, structure to it. So it's your internal world and there are no limits. And then th I think the struggle um, happens is when this love, and uh, many loves, um, uh, what I call a, a violent crash into reality, or the 3D world that we have to live in that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we have to sleep, we have to work, we have to eat, we have to um, do homework and do projects for work and deadlines. Um, and that's when, that's when the struggle starts. It's not that you don't love people, it's that you have to make room for people and having faith that the people that are in your life might not necessarily be able to make all the time for you, but they still love you. Like that's where the abundance is. You believe in the abundance of love um, and then you have to live in the realistic world, the 3D world of, you know, unfortunately I'm not going to see that person for three days in a row because I have deadlines and, and then he has other commitments. And, but the love is still there. It's just that the time is finite. Um, and I think that's the difference. I'm, I'm noticing just uh, a list of dichotomies. And, and I'm going to get to your comment in a minute. Um, you know, we've got this difference between uh, 
I guess, mainstream versus underground. We've got scarcity versus abundance. We've got privacy versus secrecy. We've got all these left versus right. And, and I just... I just keep falling back to my guiding principle, which is all dichotomies are false. They're all false. Uh, there's nothing that is just as simple as an off and on switch when it comes to an abstract concept. And these things can not only be seen as spectrums, but also multiple categories. You know, not only a matter of degree, but type. Um, and so, so like, you know, for example, if you're left-handed, well, you, you could also use your right hand on occasion. And there are people who have taught themselves to be, uh, equally dominant in both hands or born that way, or some people can use their feet, right? You could pick things up your feet. So whatever, whatever it is that we're talking about here, even if it's the difference between mono and poly, like such a supposedly clear binary, uh, you could be flexible on this. And and most of us, including on this stage, were one category and then changed and then back again and back again. And it's not always just uh, like a inherent, inset, DNA-based, I am polyamorous, I was born that way, I'll always be that way. Maybe, maybe 10 years from now, maybe three years from now, I'll change my mind. Unlikely. But... But it happens. People do this all the time. They open and close that door. So I think when when the mainstream is looking at what we're doing, they're seeing it as, you know, once you go there, there's no going back. You know, it's it's so much more fluid than that. I think they also often hear our poly as a criticism of their monogamy. And sometimes they're right, too, because often the poly community can be very scornful of monogamy, I think, in some really harmful ways, both in terms of our own health and, and in terms of our relationship with the rest of the world. I think if, if you think monogamy is unthinkable, then that's a problem. Um, I, I was chatting recently with a very young friend of mine. Um, I'm not quite old enough to be her grandmother, but uh, very, very close. And she was saying, you know, I met a, a new person the other day who was telling, their, telling me they were monogamous. And it sounded to me like some sort of weird DS kink, like, you're only going to have sex with one person ever? Uh, uh, but then I thought, well, yeah, it's sort of like some DS kink. It's, you know, they, they both want it, and it's fine, because that's what they both want. And so that was the way she wrapped her head around it, and it works fine for me, actually. We, we had a raised hand here. Yeah, yeah I just, I, you, you started to hit on it. Part of the, the reason that I tell kink-oriented people to really watch their language, and I want to advance this also to non-kink-identified poly people, Part of the reason you're having difficulty being accepted is that a lot of you are assholes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are. You come, a lot of you come with this, why aren't you poly? What is your problem? Why are you so hung up about it? Lighten up, relax, let go. Everyone's really poly. There was this book that some guy wrote that basically like just d d described um, um, monogamy as some sort of, of dead-end pool in the evolutionary process. Oh, for fuck's sake. What this, what this book was. It was a big thing, and all the poly people were raving around. Like, are you talking about sex at dawn? Yes. Sex at dawn, yeah. 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 Right. yeah. And the thing is, you know, I identify as monoamorous, so I love one person, but, like, sometimes I want to get my freak on and drive from somebody else, and that's super cool. But if a poly person comes to me to try to space me with this, like, well, what's wrong with you? Many of your profits are very, very, very greasy and not very delicious on the plate. So look, look amongst yourselves, and when you see that kind of behavior, when you see that behavior, call it out. If you have the poly friend who is mocking monogamous people, call them out. Call them back. Yeah. And and that will spearhead on, on a grassroots level so many more people being on your side. And as you're pointing out, understanding that we have much more in common than we do differently. The differences in the black community, non-monogamous relationships are old. <laughs> we, don't, we don't call it non-monogamy, but everyone's, you know, uncle had the side bitch, you know, and the side bitch might have had three more side motherfuckers that she was hooking up with. We just didn't organize it the same way, but culturally, the shit was going down. And if you look around, so many people are doing this. When you express it that way, people are like, oh, well, I, pff, I know about that shit. And now you've got someone on your side. So look at how you're messaging. I think that's awesome. I loved everything that you said, and thank you. Yeah, I, that was unfortunately, awesome. Unfortunately, most people missed the first half of it because we didn't have the mic on there. So let me summarize real quick, if I could. Basically, that um, that when you are pollier than thou and up high on your pedestal. 
Uh, looking down on all the people that don't use the word you use to identify with and saying I'm somehow superior. And that gets mirrored in the kink community where, well, you're vanilla and I'm uh, more interesting than you. Um, you know, I'm the most interesting man in the room kind of thing. Um, and, 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 you know, basically, we're, you're, and I fully agree with you. You know, I've, I've been battling this for years, and you mentioned earlier, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which is the most hated and most popular style there is of non-monogamy. You know, and I practiced it for years, so I know that it can work. It can work, but you know, everybody wants to be better than the next guy. Sure. I mean, I, I feel like every time we talk about it, I, I normally prefi uh, prefix it by saying it's not for everyone. Just like some of us feel like monogamy isn't for us, you have to recognize the other side of that coin, which is non-monogamy isn't for everyone. The way that you feel is, is mirrored on the other side, so you have to be respectful for that. I, I kind of think that if we lived in a world where everybody could choose the relationship style that we wanted without judgment, um, that most of us would drift back and forth according to the circumstances of our lives. We would all want to be slutting around in our teen and, high, and college years because that's what one does uh, and, and should do, really, because how else are you going to learn? And then, you know, you get to the point in your life when you're thinking about maybe some kids and you're on, on an upward career track and you're busier than hell. And who has time for outside lovers then? So you'd be monogamous for a while and then you get into your 30s or 40s and the kids are all in their groove and the career is in its groove and you have some time on your hands and hey, I think I'll be Polly again, and then you get old like me and you don't feel like having sex at all anymore and you have a nice domestic partner <laughs> that, you, that you're home with, and that's that. You know, and I think we make it that you have to plant your flag that says Polly, usually putting it through your own foot on the way, and um, <laughs> it, it just is, it, that's not the way life is unless you have very strong judgments that you need to haul out and look at. That's actually really amazing to hear. What my, a lot of my coaching is around this idea of relationship by design. And it's exactly what you're saying. What is, what is the right relationship for the people, for the person, for the people in, in, that, in that relationship? What is the right structure? Not what you hear and what you should be doing and what Disney tells you or what, you're, you, know, what you thought you would be. But, but let's take a stock of where you are right now, what your needs are and, and the people that you want attached to you, during that, you know, on that path and what that looks like. So let's just design one that serves everybody involved. Um, so it's awesome to hear you say that. We have a question upstairs. So, so we're actually getting to the end of the first third here. We, we've been on stage for quite a while, so I, I'd like to save that question for the, to kick off the second half. Can we do that? Is, 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 is kick off the second part with that question? All right, great. So I, I just want to give a big round of applause for... So thank you to thank you to Janet, to Kitty, to Effie. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>